Well, today I'm talking about all things LGBT. What does God have to say about it? And it's a topic, frankly, I kind of want to avoid. And I'm going to forgo any kind of fancy opener because, you know, it's just kind of a sensitive topic. So if we're gonna have a meaningful conversation, the first thing I need to do is establish a few biblical truths, definitions, and frameworks. The first thing I've gotta settle for everybody is, no matter who you are, God loves you, period. Your sexual identity has nothing to do with God's love for you. The second biblical truth is exclusively for Christians. If you claim to be a follower of Yeshua, your mandate, my mandate, is to love our neighbor as ourself, whether they're gay, straight, or otherwise. Now, you don't have to agree with their lifestyle, but if you've been mean in any way to someone a part of the LGBT community, you need to repent and stop. The third biblical truth has to do with definitions and jurisdiction. You see, in the Bible, there's a difference between making a judgment and being judgmental. God does want us to discern, to have good judgment or righteous judgment, but he doesn't want us to be judgmental. He doesn't want us to condemn or hurt people. And even then, there's a matter of jurisdiction. We are limited as Christians to judging people within the context of the church. We have no right to judge people outside the church. If people don't want to be a Jesus follower, we're mandated to leave them alone. Listen to the Apostle Paul. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do you not judge those who are within the church, but those who are outside? God judges. So if you're watching this video and you've not committed your life to Yeshua, to Jesus, I just have one job with you and that's it. You're outside my jurisdiction. I can't tell you how to live, but I can tell you this. My relationship with Jesus is real. All my sins are forgiven and it feels really awesome. And I too have fallen short of God's glory or God's expectation. And I'm so glad that Jesus, Yeshua, died on the cross for my sins. And you know, here's the thing about my father. I wanna be just like him. And so for me to condemn you and hurt you when I've been trained my whole life to die for you. You know, I might disagree with some of the things that you do, but don't think I hate you. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. So before I move on, I think it's important that you hear my heart on the matter. If you're a gay, my assumption is, is that you have many of the same desires that I do. You just want to belong and feel loved and you'd like to be treated equally. When you go to get a job, you'd like to know that you have a fair shot. When you do your taxes, that that's the same too. And I think that when you go out publicly, it's a potential that you want to show your affections in the same way that everybody else does. I understand that. So the question becomes, why don't people like me just allow that to happen? I mean, what's the big deal? So I'm gonna do my best to give you a short, compassionate and intelligent answer. So as a thought experiment, what I would like you to do is picture a red Prius. Now my guess is when you did that, you pictured something that looks like this and not like this. And the reason has to do with your experience. When you were little, you were taught to associate the word red or R-E-D with this color and not this color. Now as an English speaking community, we've decided in an arbitrary way that red looks like this and not like purple or green or blue. And I suppose if we wanted to, we could change all that. But with gender and marriage, it's a bit different. Now, I realize that some of you could care less about what the Bible says. And right now, it's a bit beside the point. All I want you to see is the biblical logic. Now, the reason for the binary, the maleness and femaleness, has to do with the Bible central claim. It illustrates the sort of relationship that God wants to have with his people, the, the church or the ecclesia. So what does that look like exactly? It's that God wants a wife for his son, In Genesis, we're told that God made Adam a male, and then Adam desired a suitable companion, but none was found. God put Adam to sleep, then pulled Eve, a female, out of his side. Then there's the second Adam. His name is Jesus. He's God, but in human form. God desired a suitable companion, but none was found. God then allowed the second Adam to be put to sleep or crucified, and then began the process of pulling what we might call the second Eve out of his side, and she is known as the Bride of Messiah. This framework permeates the entire Bible, but you can most clearly see it in Ephesians chapter 5, where the Apostle Paul talks about husbands and wives and how they're to relate to one another. And then the Apostle Paul basically backdoors you and says, hey, this marriage thing, this was designed to help you see something that you wouldn't otherwise see. 
So for most Christians, there's a danger in ridding of the binary and a danger in ridding of the male-female marriage construction. If we normalize same-sex marriage, there is no doubt that over time we will lose one of the foundational frameworks by which we're to understand our relationship with God. So if you're not a follower of Jesus, just remember that you're outside my jurisdiction. And while you are more than welcome to watch the rest of this video, my comments are not directly aimed at you, but to the Christian community. So here's what I'm finding. Like the political discourse in the United States, Christianity as a religion is becoming increasingly polarized. There's some Christians who think that gay marriage is okay. It's a theologically untenable position. And in just a little bit, I'm gonna cover some of the arguments of this book, God and the Gay Christian by Matthew Vines. But then on the other side, there's a large number of insensitive Christians who don't understand that the LGBT community isn't all represented by sensationalists such as James Charles and Jeffree Star and Todrick Hall. And then there's people like Pepe Julian Onzima, who is a serious human rights activist in Uganda. And in this video, at least the one linked below, Pepe does a pretty good job of expressing sanely and calmly the plight of people whose phenotypes express something different than what's playing out in the person's mind. So removing just for a moment the sensationalized aspects of the LGBT conversation, at the heart of the matter, the LGBT community is simply asking, is it too much to be treated fairly and equally? And that's where things get a little bit complicated. Let's see if I can uncomplicate it. Now, 20 years ago in the United States, those on Capitol Hill felt that for federal purposes, that defining marriage as the union between one man and one woman was a way to do just that. And it is a way with the caveat. You see, worldly governments can't or shouldn't unilaterally define marriage. The federal government can align itself with the one who has the authority to define marriage, and that's Yahweh, but they can't actually define it. You see, in the same way Christians have a jurisdiction, so do our lawmakers. So at the time when DOMA was passed, the U.S. political sphere had made a portion of the people sphere happy and a portion of the people sphere sad. You see, they defined marriage as something that looks like this. But then there was other people that came along and said, well, couldn't it look like this or this or this or this? And it was an important question. So because of the Defense of Marriage Act, Edith Windsor took our government to task. She went to court and she basically said, hey, why am I not being treated fairly? My car looks like this, it doesn't look like that. So if not all cars are red, can't we just call them all red for the sake of fairness? And that's where our government made a major misstep. Instead of just treating everyone equally, what they did was they redefined marriage. They were no longer in alignment with Yahweh, instead they got out of alignment with Yahweh. And that's not good. Now, I didn't agree with President Clinton on very many things, but one thing I did agree with. He said that DOMA would unnecessarily divide our country, and he's exactly right. You know, you can't legislate morality. If you're a Christian, you have to understand that our influence needs to happen at the ground level. It can't happen through legislation. We can pass right laws, and that's good, but if you try to force that on people, God doesn't force God's stuff on us, and so that's problematic. If you want to get all smart on this, you can read Jürgen Habermas' theory of communicative action. And basically what Habermas says is, hey, if the system or the political sphere tries to colonize the life world, you're looking for a legitimation crisis. Here's how it works. First, there's the life world. This is where life happens, where people talk and develop a common culture. Then there's the system and it's characterized by money and power. I'll focus on the government in this video, but it includes all sorts of other powerful things. Holding the two together is something like a zipper, an agreement of sorts, one where the life world or the people legitimize the system by being good citizens, and in turn, the government makes and enforces theoretically good laws. So along comes DOMA. It's a good law. If you're down with God defining the good, but if you're not, that can be a problem. And if at this point you're saying to yourself, this is way too much logic. Well, let's talk about logic for a second. Look, I understand the pain, but there's a world of difference between creating an anthem song and a God who not only died for us, but truly sympathizes with our weaknesses. So why exactly did DOMA fail? Well, there's lots of reasons, but I think the primary reason has to do with the fundamental idea that was first articulated in North Carolina's 1776 Constitution, 
and then it rapidly spread to other states. The statute basically said that people get to worship God in pretty much any way they want. Well, at the time, it was a radical statement because before that, the prevailing thought was that God got to choose how people worshiped. To learn more, you can read Jonathan Lehman's book, Political Church. Well, here's what happened with DOMA. First, a small group of people cried foul because they didn't agree with Yahweh's law. Then lots of people cried foul, effectually calling our government into question, which led to a legitimation crisis, which led to politicians trying to figure out how they were gonna keep their jobs. But then all that magically disappeared when our court system ruled DOMA unconstitutional repeatedly because it violated the due process and equal protection clauses in the fifth and 14th amendments. So let's wrap up this important section and hear me clearly on this. First, whether you're gay, straight, lesbian, queer, or you're a Christian, Hindu, Muslim, it doesn't matter. If you're a part of a sovereign nation, you need to have equal protection under the law. And I support that. Second, in the same way Starbucks should be selling coffees and lattes and not ideologies, our government should be establishing justice, ensuring domestic tranquility, providing for the common defense, and making sure that everyone's welfare is A-OK, -okay, instead of defining what is God's alone to define. But that's not what's happening, and the new definitions are changing the way people think. There's even a phrase for what we're seeing happen right before us. It's called social constructionism. First we shape our stuff, in this case our words, and then our words shape us. So why the 2010 tipping point? Well, it seems to me that it had a lot to do with the change in our nation's leadership. We went from a don't ask, don't tell policy to a celebratory policy, and both in my estimation missed the mark. Now here's what we all understand. If you're an American citizen, you pretty much know that we live in a great country. We have freedoms that no other civilization has ever had. At the same time, we can't be naive. We're always being colonized. We may be asked to behave in ways that are consistent or not consistent with the kingdom of God. Our government, for example, wants you to buy, buy, buy because flowing money is good for the economy. And so interest rates are constantly going up and down and tax structures are being adjusted to get you, the consumer, to consume. And if you happen to think that the religion of consumerism has plagued the Western church just because, I'd say absolutely not. We've been programmed to think that way. In fact, some people even go so far as to use the Bible, like the parable of the talents, to justify the greed, and it's just not right. And the same thing is happening with gender and sexual identity. Increasingly, I'm finding that Christians are reading something into their Bibles that's just not there. And this might be happening for a number of reasons, but you know, here's my top three. Number one, uh, Christians aren't reading their Bibles, and so they just don't know what's in there. Secondly, I think that Christians are confusing salvation with sanctification, and then finally, a lot of Christians who were born after the turn of the century, those who came of age, you know, kind of during the 2010 era, uh, these folks are being colonized and the system is quite literally changing their thinking. So before I go through Matthew Vine's book and video, basically the same content, I want to recommend Preston Sprinkle's People to be Loved. In that book, he delivers a compassionate theology and does a good job of separating out uh, same-sex attraction from same-sex behavior. And he also does it in a way that doesn't disparage people. So thanks, Preston. So now about Vine's book and video, the link's below. In Genesis 19, Vine claims that the issue there is gang rape and not same-sex behavior. And then to substantiate his claim, he takes a look at Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49, where it seems that the issue is violence and hostility, and that's true. But then he neglects verse 50, which he probably shouldn't. But more importantly, he neglects Jude 1.7, where Jude explicitly states the problem. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah, Jude writes, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh. And it seems to me that both Jude and Ezekiel are both right. And then Vine cites Leviticus chapters 18 and 20. And in there, he rightly identifies that Yahweh really doesn't like same-sex intercourse at all. But then he says, you know, the other things that God doesn't like is eating pork and eating shellfish and rabbit and having sex with a woman on her menstrual period. And God doesn't like any of that. And I don't do any of it. If God's law says no parking, I don't park there. And then Vines goes on to assert that according to Hebrews 8.13, that Yahweh abolished the law code. No, Yahweh did not abolish the law code. The issue was not the law. The issue was the covenant. And that's different. Think of a man and woman about to get married. There's the wedding vows, and then there's the commitment they make to each other to stay true to those vows. 
If the man cheats, that doesn't make the vows bad, rather it makes the covenant bad. In Hebrews 8.13, the issue isn't the law code, but rather the cheating heart of one of the covenant partners. You can see it in Hebrews 8.8. 8. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second, for finding fault with them. And when Vines asserts that Yeshua is the end of the law, the words in Greek don't mean the stop of the law, but rather the destination aim or the telos of the law. And that's a big difference. Now in Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, Vines rightly states that Yahweh gave people over to the lusts of their hearts because they had rejected him. And then to illustrate the depths of those lusts, the Apostle Paul says that people exchange natural relations for unnatural ones. And here's what Vines does with Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and then 1 Timothy 1, 10. He basically says, hey, Paul's context was completely different than ours. Whereas Paul associated same-sex relations with something that happened in the dark, like in a back alley like this one, he says that today is completely different, that gay people share in committed, monogamous, faithful relationships. So in some sense, Vines is right. There is a contextual difference between Paul's day and our day. But at the same time, all Paul was doing was applying God's righteous law to his then present context. So in that regard, the meaning of two Greek words, malakoi and arsenikoitai, are somewhat superfluous. At the same time, I don't think Vines is giving you a responsible translation. Most scholars agree that malakoi described the effeminate passive partner in male sexual activity, and arsenikoitai described the active partner. That said, from a biblical interpretation standpoint, nothing's really changed. In the same way Jesus used the covenant law or the Torah to correct abuses and poor interpretations in the Sermon on the Mount, Paul applies the Torah to his context, and we should be doing the same. From there, Vines goes on to suggest that the Apostle Paul uses the same word, unnatural paraphusis, to describe the unnaturalness of men having long hair and also gay relationships. And then he wants us to reason that now that long hair is okay, why isn't same-sex marriage okay? Now, context is really important here. When the Apostle Paul speaks of hair length, he is only doing so to further bolster the idea that men should look masculine in a reasonable, healthy way, and women should look feminine in a reasonable, healthy way. Women, don't hear that I'm calling you weak because that ain't true. Now, two more quick issues here. Doesn't the Apostle Paul say that because of the new covenant, there's no longer Jew or Gentile or male or female? Well, he does, but it's kind of like getting a ticket. If you get a ticket, you go into this courthouse. That judge doesn't care if you're male or female. You're just getting a ticket. In relation to the new covenant, God doesn't care if you're male or female, Jew or Gentile. You're going to get in if you know Jesus as your Savior. But Christians are confusing salvation with sanctification. Here's what I'm hearing. Aren't all sins equal? Well, with regard to salvation, yeah, anything's going to keep you out of the kingdom of heaven. And so we all have fallen short and we need the blood of a Passover lamb to cleanse us, to forgive us. But when it comes to sanctification, that's different. Not all sins are equal in the eyes of God. Some are more damaging to the kingdom than others, and we need to be mindful of that. So none of this is a question of God's love. God loves us all in our brokenness just the way we are. The question rather is, do you love God? Repeatedly in the Bible, God associates love with obedience. Are you willing to make the necessary adjustments to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? That's the question. Whatever your sexual orientation or your gender identity, God loves you and I want to love you. And I'm going to start by telling you the truth.